We have now discussed work and kinetic energy in previous videos and in class. In this new video, we're going to explore the idea of potential energy, with a focus on the idea of gravitational potential energy in the flat earth approximation that we've been using throughout this course. Let's begin by thinking about the amount of work done by gravity. So let's say we have some ball, and it falls through some height h, and then is dragged across the floor the same distance h. How much work is done by the force of gravity on the ball over this path? So we're looking for the work done by gravity on this path equals what? Now you'll recall from a previous video that work is defined as the force times the displacement times the cosine of the angle in between. For this particular path, I'm going to need to think about it in two pieces. One for the fall and one for the horizontal motion. Because for each of these steps, the theta is different. During the fall, the theta is equal to zero because both the force and the displacement are in the same direction. For the horizontal part of the ball's motion, however, theta is equal to 90 degrees. So we'll just consider the work done by gravity over the falling part and then add the work done by gravity on the horizontal part and just do it in two pieces. For the work done by gravity during the fall, we have the force of gravity times the distance, which is just this quantity h, times cosine of the angle in between, which for this case is zero, zero degrees. And the cosine of zero degrees is one. So the work done by gravity during the fall is the force of gravity times h, and we know that the force of gravity on this ball, if the ball has mass m, is just mg. So we can just say that the work done by the force of gravity during the fall is mgh. Now, let's move on to the horizontal part. On the horizontal part, we have essentially the same thing. The work done by gravity on the horizontal part is the force of gravity times the distance traveled, which is again h, times the cosine of the angle in between, which in this case is 90 degrees. Now the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So that makes the second calculation fairly straightforward. The work done by gravity on the horizontal part is zero joules, which means that the total work done, which we calculate by adding the two together, is going to be just this work here. So the work done by gravity over this full path is just mgh. Now, let's consider moving the ball to the same final position from the same initial position via a different path. Instead of going straight down and straight over, let's move at a 45 degree angle directly from the initial position to the final position, like so. Let's try and figure out the amount of work done by the force of gravity on this path. So along this path here, which we'll call diagonal, how much work is done by the force of gravity? As before, we start from the definition of work, which is just the force times the distance times the cosine of the angle in between. The force is once again the force of gravity, so we can just write our force as the mass of the ball times g, where the mass of the ball is just m. Now we need to think a little bit more about the distance that the ball is traveling. This forms a right triangle of two legs h. So the distance traveled along this side is going to be equal to the square root of h squared plus h squared, or equivalently, h 
times the square root of 2. So that means that our distance that our ball is traveling is h times the square root of 2. Now we just have to address the cosine of the angle in between. And in this particular problem, the angle in between the force, which is down, and the path, which is on this angle, is 45 degrees. Now, the cosine of 45 degrees is 1 over the square root of 2. If you were to plug it into your calculator, you would see 0 0.707, and those two numbers are equivalent. Now let's put everything together. The work done by gravity along this diagonal path is the force mg, the distance h times the square root of 2, and the cosine of the angle in between, which is 1 over the square root of 2. We can see that the square root of 2 cancels out, and that the work done by gravity on this diagonal path is once again mgh. We get the exact same answer regardless of if the ball goes straight down and straight over, or if the ball follows a diagonal path. The result is the same. The amount of work done by gravity only depends upon the initial height of the ball and the final height of the ball. That's all it depends upon. So let's establish a coordinate system to help us a little bit later in this video. Let's define the positive y direction to be up as we normally do. With this coordinate system and with zero at the floor, the initial height of the ball is going to be h, so the initial height for both balls is just h. The final height is 0. Which means the delta y, yf minus yi, as it always is, final minus initial, mean, gives us a delta y of negative h. Now let's stop to think about the sign of work done by gravity in this particular problem. The work done by gravity in this problem is going to be positive. Both gravity and displacement of the ball are in the same general direction. Both are down towards the floor. Thus, the work must be positive. In fact, it, we've calculated it, it must be positive mgh. Trying to convert to the coordinate system we have in this problem, we can use delta y equals negative h and substitute for h, giving us that the work done by gravity is mg times minus delta y. Now m and g are constants, so we can pull them inside the delta and the negative sign comes outside, giving us the work done by the force of gravity is minus delta m gy, which if you were to expand it out, gives you the work done by gravity being minus mgyf minus mgyi. This may seem like a lot of formula manipulations at this particular point, but bear with me for a minute. It'll come in in a second. Now let's think about gravity conceptually for a minute in terms of work, our new ideas of work and energy. So let's have some table. We'll put a little cart on it, set up a pulley on the edge of the table, and string a cart from the pulley to some weight. When I let go of the weight, the weight falls and pulls the cart, exerting a force over a distance on our cart. The falling mass, albeit indirectly, does work on the cart. The force of gravity pulling the mass down did work on our cart, which means that the relative positions of the mass and the earth have a possibility to do work. That mass just sitting above the earth 
has a possibility of doing work. And if you remember from last class, the possibility to do work is what energy is. In other words, there is energy in the system solely from the relative positions of the objects of the mass in the Earth. We call this energy due to the relative positions potential energy. Note the mass can't have potential energy by itself. I have to think about the relative position of the mass and the Earth. It's the two objects together that give me the idea of potential energy. But we happen to know how much work the force of gravity can do on that mass and consequently indirectly on the cart because we have looked at it for a falling ball earlier in this video. The amount of work done by gravity is always minus delta mgy. We call this mgy the potential energy due to the relative positions of the earth and the ball or in the case of the cart the relative positions of the earth and the hanging mass. Mathematically we write this as ug equals mgy. You may see in other contexts potential energy written as PE. I don't really like this notation because to me this looks like P times E. It's two letters multiplied together. And it makes it somewhat confusing. Since there's already a bunch of other things in physics that use the letter P, like pressure and momentum, I prefer instead of using PE or P to use U. U doesn't seem to be used very much, so I'm going to use U for potential energy. So the potential energy due to gravity from the relative positions of, say, a ball in the Earth or a mass in the Earth is given by mgy. We choose this definition for the conceptual reason that more y, or higher off the ground, means more potential energy. This matches with our intuitive understanding. The higher an object is off the ground, the more work it can potentially do, so the more energy it must have. However, it does result in kind of a goofy negative sign. With this definition of potential energy and this result for work, we see that the work is equal to negative the change in potential energy minus delta U. This minus sign is purely a consequence from our choices here, but we make this choice so that our definition of potential energy makes some conceptual sense. So now let's put it, everything together, potential energy, kinetic energy, and work for an object just falling, probably the simplest case we can think of. So as an object just falls from a height yi to a height yf, we know that the work done by gravity on the ball is given by the change in the gravitational potential energy. Work equals minus delta u. Now, delta is always finus, final minus initial, so work is minus the quantity u final minus u initial. Or distributing the minus sign, work is u initial minus u final. And this is the work done by the force of gravity on the falling object. But we also know from the work energy theorem that the change in kinetic energy of the ball is given by work equals delta k. Recall that this expression, where as long as we're talking about the network, is always true. As long as we're talking about the network, the sum of all the works on the object, the network is going to be equal to the change in kinetic energy. For this particular falling object, the only force acting on it is the force of gravity, so the network is equal to the work done by gravity, which is calculated using potential energy. Delta is again final minus initial. Now, if we go through and set this work equal to this work, we get this expression, which after rearranging gives us something that looks a little bit more interesting. Ui plus Ki equals Uf plus Kf. Or in other words, 
conservation of energy. Whatever energy we start with is the energy we end with. We see that energy is conserved for gravitational forces. I can convert freely from potential energy to kinetic energy back and forth without any loss, at least in principle. The real world is, of course, a little bit messier. But we can also see that the idea of work is central to this whole thing of conservation of energy. So work is how we connect potential energy to kinetic energy, get, giving us conservation of energy. And work is also how we connect energy to our previous understanding of forces. Now you might be thinking to yourself, is energy always conserved? Yes, this is a fundamental concept of the universe. You might also be asking yourself, is there a potential energy for every force we've talked about? Say, springs, friction, electrical forces. Well, the answer to that is not every force has a potential energy. This is a concept that will be explored in one of the later videos on conservative versus non-conservative forces. In addition, I recommend that you watch some of Heath Hatch's videos to see examples of how to use this idea in physics problems. This concludes this video.